Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Mechanical Techno Show. I have another amazing podcast for you this week. Uh, before we get going, I just want to say that it's been amazing uh, to see the amount of people and to be getting the amount of DMs from people uh, that are enjoying what we're doing here on the podcast. So thank you very, very much if you are a returning listener. Um, and if you're not a thousand thank yous for coming and, and taking a punt on uh, what we do. And uh, I really hope you enjoy it. If you're watching on YouTube, we would really appreciate a uh, subscribe, follow, and also uh, a like on the video. Just so the algorithm knows what we're doing is a good thing, and it sends all the information out to people um, so that even more people can enjoy can enjoy these interviews and get a lot more from what we're doing. So, without further ado, another amazing artist for you. In fact this one is really special and i mean they're all special they're all amazing artists in their own right anyone that comes and joins me on the podcast but this one this one is really really special for me because not only is he a true pioneer of the underground london scene but he's also a very good friend of mine somebody who has been there for me for a long time now um helping me to build my career and uh to understand the importance of um things like networking and uh um, and building relationships which I keep banging on about and I will always do so and let me tell you a little bit about him so he started in the early 90s in the London te techno scene as one of the original Stay Up Forever collective and has since become an absolute iconic name throughout underground techno not just the london techno scene he uh, broke away from the acid techno scene in the mid 90s to pursue other avenues of percussive techno style uh, with his label hydraulics and um, has since become one of the fathers of the sound and um, quite honestly i don't know if i know anybody uh, more as respected as him uh, within the community so without further ado let me introduce you to the one and only henry cullen aka dave the drummer how's it going mate hello yeah hello. yeah good <laughs> thank you yeah going all right doing all right yeah, yeah. yeah. so mate you're um you're officially a Berlin bathroom hall now. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There, well, yeah, it was... Um, is it good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, 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 it was really fun. I really enjoyed it. It was... Uh, I was supposed to be gigging in Berlin that weekend and uh, and it got cancelled uh, quite a long time ago, actually. Uh, we didn't have the flights in place or anything like that. I could have just not done it. But it just so happened that for that weekend, I don't play in Berlin that often. So I asked my agency, Raw, if they would get in touch with Haw and see if they would be interested. I didn't know how to get hold of Haw apart from yeah. sending them messages through it, the channel. The DMs, yeah. yeah. And um, so I couldn't find an email for them. They, they said, yeah, 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 we can do it. So they got in touch with them and... Um, and they said, yeah, we, we can do it on that weekend. And then almost like immediately the Berlin gig got cancelled. And oh, I thought, plums. do I just pay for it myself and go over and do it for the hell of it? Or do I uh, try and postpone it? And I thought, well, if I postpone it, I might not have, ever get that yeah. like, opportunity again. It's one of them, isn't it? It's just, yeah. I, I mean, I'd love to do it. There's a couple of things like, that. I don't know why that's, why that particular um uh sort of setup has become so but i guess it's because everyone's kind of played it and it's just become quite iconic but essentially it's um that is all it's all a youtube successful mm. youtube channel ever really is it's a, you no one ever really does anything that's particularly massively different from anybody else it's it's just a dj playing in a bathroom there's really nothing particularly spectacular about it but they've had loads of really famous artists in yeah, there loads right? of famous yeah it's been it's crazy it that kind of secured the, the 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 you know the reputation it was who sorry it was the pandemic oh the pandemic you know, yeah, yeah yeah true um, yeah very true just just um they literally started like a couple of months just before covid really landed and uh and of course, it was good timing. Uh, I thought they'd yeah. be going a lot longer than that. I don't know why. It was. It's, I think I'm getting it mixed up with the boiler room because that's another thing that I'll, I want to oh, try oh, yeah. and get me yeah. at some point. Is do a boiler room? That'd be fun. Because Ali did one, didn't he? 
He, he did one because I know he played your remix of my track. I think Boiler Room, from my understanding of Boiler Room, I mean, I don't, uh, I've met, I, I, I remember going to the cause in London. Uh, I went down there because I wanted to go and look at the, this is the old venue when they were in Tottenham. Mm. And I wanted to go, it was from, for my 50th birthday, I wanted to do a hydraulics party and I was going going down to the cause just to say hi and have a look at the venue. Yeah. Um meet the team and when i got there they were setting up for a boiler room for somebody else i don't i don't know who it was i forget who it was um and so i met a couple of people from boiler room um and asked them a little bit like what you know what's the story like how is this how does it work and mm -hmm. they said well it's kind of it started off as a website that they purely did their own thing but then they franchised it out so now what what people do is you know you can kind of book boiler room to come to your event and you do mm -hmm. a event and it costs i don't know how much um and some promoters do it and some don't and i think that's the way it seems to work and the boiler room right. people all the gear um and do the yeah. set up the recording and you basically provide the djs and the and the crowd which is why some boiler rooms are absolutely ram jammed and others just aren't right you know? okay i've got you i've got you. I've, I've, i did wonder how you get into one of them events yeah. as a, as a counter, so I think Boiler Room themselves also run events. They started off running events as Boiler Room initially, I think, as far as I know, uh, and then it kind of grew. So now, you know, other people run Boiler Room franchised events, but occasionally Boiler Room do their own specific thing or they get invited to do an, an area at a festival. Like there was a big Malta festival, wasn't there, what, uh, last year, the summer last year, and Boiler Room did it. Like um, Hector Oaks was playing and... Mm. Uh, somebody uh, a few well-known djs i can't remember exactly who but but it was it was quite good and um and i remember boiler room being you know like they had an area that was all just boiler room but apart from that you know I, like and what i've just said might be complete nonsense so somebody from boiler room might be in there and <laughs> yeah, okay. but right ah uh, yeah. well yeah. you know what it doesn't matter but, it's uh we're it's on the list in it for things to do i mean um when last party we did it uh fold they'd set the decks up in the middle of the room which was yeah. ace i wasn't expecting that at all and um i think mm. every every dj just that played had a I know, it just felt really special because it was just you're just like I've never been the kind of DJ that loves to stand there and lord it up in front of people. I like to I'm a I'm a raver at heart, so I like to get in. You know, I like to get in a mix with you know all of the peoples. It's not um, me and them. It's just we're all together. You know, having a good party and um, yeah. and when you kind of like get put in that position and you're DJ and you're kind of catering to them and you just feed off their energy. It's a, it's a nice little vibe, actually. I, I enjoy it. Yeah. I mean, it, it was, it was nice. Uh, I wasn't expecting it when we got there. I yeah. was a bit like, Oh, what, you know, what's going <laughs> what <you> on? <laughs> yeah, because I wasn't expecting it. Cause normally in that second room, they normally set all the decks and yeah. sound at the far end. The, the but, sound uh, wasn't, the, it did affect the sound a little bit. Unfortunately, we did have a little bit of clapback, but it wasn't, you know, we're all professionals. Is, we're all professionals. That's the problem with the uh, surround sound or, mm -hmm. you know, obviously DJ standing in front of the rig kind of setup. Mm -hmm. you, 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 can, you can get, uh, there can be like a, a little delay between what's happening on the monitor and what's happening on the sound system. Yeah. And that creates a, a little bit of a, uh, a, a, a kind of slight uh, flam kind of on the in the music that the, yeah. the dj yeah. notices it much more than anybody else oh, 100 yeah we always do don't we <laughs> everyone <laughs> complains about it but you really notice it when you're standing behind the deck unless you just turn the monitors off completely and use the it. what we used to do years ago i mean i remember going to a club in spain years ago and watching i think it was christian varela you know years ago oh. and uh in northern spain i used to play a lot in in vigo in north spain um yeah. and you know they had these big clubs these big old kind of spanish style nightclubs with you know like a big kind of like tiled floors and you know real classic kind of places you know mm. the sort of places that you don't really see that it's you don't really see that so often anymore um, but back then it was that was what spanish nightclubs all looked like uh, and, uh, when uh, venues actually had money to stay open <laughs> yeah when, when venues were venues yeah yeah, right. venues venues, yeah. 
Yeah. And um and uh yeah, they had that. I remember going and watching. I, I'm sure I'm sure it was Varela. It was either Varela or it was Malero. It was one of those two because they were both the big, big. And I'm big famous. It was a big place, and I remember the guys being really like, "Oh, we have to go." You know, he's like a legend already. Mm-hmm. This is years, fucking years ago. It's like the uh, end of the nineties, and um, you know, so um, uh, we we got there, and I remember watching the DJ, whoever it was, like mixing vinyl in the middle of the room with the t- with all the sound system at one one end. And no monitors, no monitors at all. I, just, I, I, I was just like, how the like, fuck are you doing that? You know, I, I mean, I, yeah, yeah. There's professionals and then there's professionals, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, I know. On vinyl as well. Bloody bad, hell, no button. Yeah, no, no way out. You just got to the, the way to do it is, you know, the the your music is always going to be slightly ahead of whatever is coming out of the sound system. So it's going to be, now, isn't it? That is mad. Uh, yeah. So you 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 you'll have a uh, an amount of time that um what the way that we used to do it were I mean I've played a few gigs like that with terrible monitors or just no monitor at all mm-hmm. and the way we used to do it was you know you cue the track up in your headphones as you would do normally and you chuck it in put the fader up hear the delay and then uh, and it was always yeah. forwards you just have to jog it forwards always but it was like That's fucking try. <laughs> how much time to jog it forwards by because the music will never be coming out earlier it will yeah. always be out slightly later so you will always be slightly early if that makes any sense so you'll always like you will always have to push it push it forward to catch up and uh, I, I remember um the other way around having um uh, do you remember do you remember um electro works in angel yeah we'll go in, i think <laughs> yeah <laughs> Do you remember they used to have that dirty great um monitor on that was sat on this on the on the console and right next to the turn yeah so upstairs. whenever you're trying to mix anything oh yeah this big jockey needle city yeah um, that was yeah, a, that was a fun feedback i oh, know there was some in, in, in incredibly bad sound system setups back in the <laughs> really were i mean occasionally you go in and just go like oh my god what are they doing yeah you know, but, but yeah now we have the technology electric right? works was was particularly ear piercing i remember funny that system. old venue yeah i quite had some good nights in there but yeah it was a funny yeah. old place. so um let's start talking about the early days man because mm. that's where it all began isn't it the suf yeah. collective and all that um yeah. so how did you kind of like, because obviously it's, it's you know, you, you all kind of, I mean, I had this conversation with Ant um, and got kind of a flavour for kind of, so you you and Guy came in from the band, didn't you? And you kind of all yeah. kind of just met and just started putting on parties. Tell, tell us about kind of how that got started. Well, um, so I think, um, yeah, without going into like too much detail about Back to the Planet, the band that I was in, I yeah. was a I was drummer in, in. I was the drummer in Back to the Planet. I was the keyboard player. You're a drummer. Uh, yeah, we are. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, for anybody that was wondering. Um, so yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I was the drummer, and um, this was around about 1992 two we did an album we were on we went on the road a lot we did played a lot of squatted venues we did a lot of early style squats in the very early 90s late 80s when acid house was kind of breaking through and becoming a bit of a thing on the traveling scene and djs were becoming a thing and live music was not was kind of being edged out by a really big you know electronic music explosion um and back to the planet managed to keep it together pretty much all the way through that but one of the, some one of the things that was happening um in parallel to that was there was a club night called club dog which was started life as a psychedelic club mostly with live bands like things like gong and uh it was tentacles and you know oh, yeah, back, I remember I back to the planet and various different sort of well-known bands from the festival circuit yeah. um you know who were sort of um obviously a lot of those bands were already beginning to combine electronic music influences with their sound anyway like back to the planet where we had a like Mm. a ray kind of edge to what we were doing anyway and that was uh and club dog were slowly becoming 
more DJ or electronic music orientated, and then they they turned into Megadog. Mm -hmm. And when they started doing Megadog events, uh, the Liberator DJs were there, one of their uh, crews of um, of uh, regular DJs, uh, mm -hmm. along with Caroline, uh, Misbehaviour Caroline, um, and um, DJ Evolution, um who was also one of the their kind of resident resident is the word i'm looking for mm -hmm. and a guy called uh, rob or mc teabag he was the mc for the night and he used to sing and strut about and dance and do all sorts of crazy stuff while people played some people liked it some people didn't yeah. um probably the so teabag in that did that it's always like that with mcs you know people are like yeah you know, some people hate yeah. them um, really love them um uh, and what they were doing was they so they moved from their venue that was the sir george roby in finsbury park which was a really small little club a uh, pub and they moved from there and they moved into like the rocket on holloway road which was a much much bigger venue and they started filling out the rocket and doing things like then they had a second room that had like liberated djs in they used to get paul from orbital mm -hmm. he come and play regularly their regular de their own resident regular djs a guy called monkey pilot i think occasionally used to play michael dog as well who's one of the organizers he used to play there's two guys michael and bob dog and they were both the kind of the the the, the two organizers for the whole thing um uh, and me and my mates were sort of we were kind of involved because of the crusty squatty you know party thing that we've been involved in in the past so a friend of mine julian who i live with he was involved with club dog and um, so consequently we back to the planet played there quite a lot they had they did some really big gigs like they had plastic man come over for the first time one of the first times he ever played live in the uk played for club dog at um at the brixton academy they started doing big nights at brixton academy they had people like uh goldie and you know huge like drum and bass star obviously and many other uh really big and plus they had acts like really famous reggae acts like people like josh shaka people like that and so back to the planet uh, and they and they stuck to their psychedelic route so occasionally they do like a hawkwind night or a gong night or something like that as well so it was really like a real big mixture so you have went from everything from techno to you know drum and bass to like well, early drum and bass and mm. hardcore and you know all, all sorts of different types of things um and then and megadog ended up running a uh, a stage at Glastonbury. in fact they were the first people to run the dance stage after after glastonbury cancelled electronic music because for a few years glastonbury cancelled electronic music because there'd oh, been so there was some huge rave in the top field uh, orbital yeah, has there always is isn't there actually orbital and underworld are fucking far great as well I think Aphex Twin. Uh, so, and Aphex Twin was another person who played for uh, Megadog as well. All the homegrown talent uh, played there. Um, yeah, and so basically, because of this whole thing, um, and I was getting massively influenced with um, electronic music, and I bought a sampler and stuff to go with yeah. my drums and all that kind of stuff. Got involved with a local studio, and then rob mct bag said to me or oh, you should meet the liberator guys and maybe do a record together they run a record label and he put me in touch with with chris and one day i think i don't think i spoke to chris until chris arrived on the doorstep of the studio because i think that rob sort of did the whole bringing together yeah. said okay chris is going to be here on this day you make sure you're here and i was like okay 10 o'clock in the morning i was there in the studio making cups of tea getting ready yeah, and then yeah. all bell rang and that was, it was chris i was like all right mate how you doing and that was, we it got talking you know we were like, that was fucking out you, know. like, you know we've been in the same building a million times and yeah. we never run into each other i don't know how that's happened you know but yeah, yeah, yeah. that's basically that's basically how it started you know and nice. we, we we sat in the studio and started playing around and chris was very i'd already i wouldn't of course really you know count myself as a studio engineer at the time but chris was very very knowledgeable about rave music at that time and what yeah. and very like you know um very direct about what he wanted you know really and he was really like i want to do it like you know we need something that goes like this and i can't remember if he brought in any 
reference records or anything like that. But basically, I was like, okay, I sort of knew what he meant because I was re- I was really into my electronic music, but I was a bit more into kind of more gentle things at the time. Uh, yeah. like, so yeah, is, that, is that where the acid thing came in then or w- did you buy a 303 for 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 the its intended purpose of like giving you a baseline to drum along to or did you Well I didn't I didn't buy it you see uh, the thing was it's uh, it. uh, 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 it. a it, it was my dad's it was really? my dad's yeah no belonged way. To- have yeah. you still got the same one your dad had? Yeah, it's sitting right here. That one. Hey, that's yeah. special. That's old 303. It is, yeah. Right, that is uh, special. Basically, what happened was um, yeah, there was another guy. Uh, it, the, the studio started off as a collective studio. Um, it was actually most of the equipment in there was actually owned by a guy called John, uh, Johnny Derange, and mm. he was good, good friends with Rob Teabag and all of that. And that, I was part of what the engineering team that was there. There was four of us that were that were engineering. So yeah, and I basically what happened was um, uh, yeah, I, I was getting into acid music. This there was a, another engineer there called Max um, who was massively into hard floor, and he said it's the three hundred three that. That's the sound that makes that's what makes that sound is the is the Roland 303 and I was like all oh, right okay and um then I I don't know when the penny dropped but I sort of just s- remembered my dad once I found out what the Roland 303 actually looked like which is like this little silver box that everybody knows now but at the time it wasn't so obvious um once I remember remember what it looked like or was it, then I thought to myself my dad's got one of those. I remember being when I was about, you know, four, 14 years old. Yeah. And him, it, yeah, right, it must have been around about then, you know, 1984, 85, something like that. He had this 303. And I remember him showing me like how to program it and stuff like that. And I was completely unimpressed at the time. I just thought it was sounded all sounded a bit rubbish. Yeah. But he had been working on an album by Heaven 17 and they he had bought this um Roland 303 it wasn't one of their famous albums unfortunately it was it was when they were probably at the tail end of their career but my dad had had been working on it and I think he bought this 303 to you know as part of the, the kind of instruments that he wanted to use he was really into electronics my dad I, I mean I never really was your dad re- an engineer as well he was a he's a musician. He was a musician. musician right. He was a musician and he worked on a lot of um you know West End musicals. In the end, he, that was, that became his thing was arranging and composing and conducting music for West End musicals. Epic. Uh, he worked with a lot of really really famous people like Lloyd Webber and people like that over the years. So that's kind of what he went on to do. But at this point in time because it's a long time back, he was still he was kind of fingers in pies you know doing various different jobs for various different people and at one point he got into making pop music or kind of producing pop music and the 303 came along as part of that so i I rang him this must have been around about 1993 and i rang him 1993 1994 i called him like and said dad have you still got that that old Roland 303 and he said oh well the little silver thing he said oh yeah I've got that somewhere he said it's got it on the show oh, fucking hell and I literally I think I jumped in my shitty old car and drove down there and picked it up that night um he lived down in uh him and my mum were separated and he lived yeah. down in down in uh, uh East Sussex and I went and right. I drove yeah right flew down there like the wind and uh <laughs> <laughs> grabbed this 303 and brought it home and then and was like sitting with it in the studio i didn't know how to fucking program it or anything it was like what the fuck does this thing do yeah. but i and I, I made a quick phone call to a mate uh who told me how it worked and uh, uh you know in the phone box outside with a notepad writing it down yeah. on a piece of paper yeah uh, in the old school days you know it's Bloody funny hell. so you yeah. so you uh, you've heard it here folks so Dave it was Trump, I worked out yeah. a program of 303 in the telephone box with the scrolling on the back of a flipping notepad. That's just that I'll tell is you pretty people. much it. Yeah, talking to a guy called Phil Fidget, <laughs> who gave me my first like Here's over the phone tutorial. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, he said right now what you want to do, and I, and 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 yeah, he was mostly right. Most of what he said was right, right. It, and there was a little bit of fiddling around until I finally got 
the filled in the gaps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, getting it synchronized. It, the, the 303s don't synchronize to regular MIDI. We needed to get, I needed to go to Kenton, which was all the way over in like West London. I had to drive all the way over there because there was no fucking internet mail order back then. So, you know, if you wanted to buy something, you had to go to the shop Actually, to pick it up. Buy it, yeah. It was over the other side of London. Off you go, you know. So I went all the way over to wherever it was and, and went visited Kenton and picked up a Kenton Pro 2 uh, to convert the MIDI into Sync 24 and right. brought it, plugged it in and pressed go on the computer. And, Et voila. Off it went. Or whatever. Yeah. Uh, pattern you decided to make it was brilliant and then uh not i mean really honestly not long after that chris was in the studio and we did we did something together probably star power or one of I was his gonna uh, say do you remember your first track that you did with him uh the very very first track yeah 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 yeah, yeah. the very very first track i ever did with chris was a track called spectrum it was on um uh it was on a record label called bag and um it was played by um oh um what's his name um who did the outer limits um colin i think it was favor i can't remember it was, it was colin dale and colin favor used to play on kiss fm colin favor used to do the outer limits i think it was colin favor who right. played it on dave angel's birthday and dedicated it to dave angel so you know dave, it's by chris liberator and dave the drummer and he played it <laughs> And we were like, yeah, ah. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was fucking brilliant. Nice. Uh, but the bag label was very, very small. Uh, we sold a, a few copies. Yeah, probably yeah. made a little money from it, but not a great deal. But it was, it was really good experience. But there was lots more to come. There was lots. More yeah. To come. So early days, mm. um, you found your engineering feet, and then by God, did you find your engineering feet? I mean, we, um, I. I was, do you know what I was going to do? I was going to be really clever and I was going to top up all of your tracks that you've engineered and see if you can guess how many they were. But I, lo I ended up losing count. I just couldn't find them all. Yeah, you've I literally, know. like, when I was a kid, I remember looking on the, on the vinyl and every single vinyl I bought from Kinetic or wherever it was I bought it from had your name on it. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> I did have a period where I was like... We were knocking out, you know, two or three just, tracks. Did you day. just? Did people just come to you, and you just got a reputation for being an a decent engineer? And they come to you and say, "Oh, can you do? Can you?" Well, can there weren't you, there weren't many know. engineers, and there weren't very many studios either. I mean, people just yeah. didn't have the kit. You know, they did just didn't have the equipment. And I, I was very lucky. I was in this studio that, like I said, was owned by this guy John Derange. One of the things that John had bought that just nobody else had, to my knowledge, at that time was this. Or, or, was this hard disk recording system called soundscape which is a very early kind of all it was all in one box it was a rack unit box it just had uh two inputs and four outputs um and you could use the outputs either as two stereo pairs or you could use them as four mono outputs you, you could set it up within the box it was very basic it, it only i think we 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 changed the hard disk in it a couple of times and bumped up the hard disk to something like Oh God, I can't remember. You know, we we put something in it like a gigabyte, right. and it was like whoa. You know, uh, when the first gigabyte hard, hard drives came around, um, and you what kids, that you don't know you're born. I tell you, I know. Uh, uh, the software was for Soundscape was surprisingly tiny. I think the whole lot fitted fitted on one uh, or two two megabyte floppy disks and you so you installed it on a pc so we had two pcs we had a black and white pc that was running cubase which was uh, a crack sorry steinberg and that was on um <laughs> that was on floppy disks um i don't know how it was cracked but they were the you know whatever it, it basically so it worked we didn't have an atari which was a shame because, to be honest, the early records they suffer from having a slightly wandering timing because the Ataris were much tighter. And PCs back then, we were using Windows 3.1, and it was it was sloppy. The timing was a bit sloppy. Whether that was because it was a crack or not, I don't know. But, I mean, it wasn't so bad to the point where everything sounded terrible. Things sounded still sounded pretty good. 
but when you start to compare it with today's level of you know absolutely on the the money yeah. so it, and it meant that you couldn't do certain things like you couldn't put one kick on top of another because they would just phase against each other they just yeah. move just so you just it. learn yeah. very quickly yeah you've learned very quickly that if you wanted to keep your bottom end nice and clear you it was very much like you'd have to work on the source sound you know you'd have to get the right kick and you might have to resample that a few times and go and you know go through a few eq settings and maybe add some compression and then sample it again and stuff like that until eventually you got what you wanted to get um and so eq on the desk was was really your friend so um uh, that was the, the next thing after i got into john's studio and he showed me how to do soundscape so we had two monitors one for soundscape one for cubase soundscape was linked with uh, midi time code so you know it was just a pure straight up normal sync you press go on on cubase and it would it would play back so it's like using a tape machine but a digital tape machine and I got pretty good at using that. Uh, um, and we were used to record all the 303s onto it. So all the, the the adjustments and all the tweaks and all of that, we could record them and we could redo them. And that made a massive difference to the, um, you know, to, to, to the arrangements because you could do these really complex build-ups where things would just kind of, you know, weave around and, you know, weave in and out of each other until eventually it would all kind of, you know, you'd have a big boom, kind of drop sort of moment which was really difficult to do if you were you know a couple of guys in the studio like sure. standing over the, the 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 mixing desk and sort of pressing mute buttons and 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 it was very difficult to do that over midi as well it was much more complicated so to record stuff in in audio was was a huge change and so i started getting quite a lot of work from just people who just wanted to make music because mm a lot of people just didn't have that kind of studio stuff at home it just didn't exist there was no laptops there were no there was no ableton there was no none most people if you wanted to buy a sampler those samplers were about two grand at the time they were fucking expensive so i had an akai s3200 which i got from my back to the planet days and i had an akai s1100 xl which also came from the back to the planet days and i brought those into the studio and that really upgraded what they, they had in the studio before um johnny had a few synths lying around and we some of them we even had to put them back together like there was a monopoly that was literally in a plastic bag just bits <laughs> and me and marshall put that together and we were absolutely shocked when we put the last final component in and plugged it in and it, it works, works. <laughs> oh, fucking hell, no way <laughs> I, I think john had bought this thing in pieces from a local junk shop and whoever it was to taking it apart and just never bother putting it back never together. Again. Put it back together, yeah. Yeah. So we put it back together and it was like, it fucking works. No way. So <laughs> you still got so all that got, old kit then, or is it? I've um, got bits and pieces, not much of it. I've got to be, I've got to be in the days family. before planned obsolescence when they I had make things to a, break. I had a bit of a period of time a few years ago where I really hit uh, hard times financially. I wasn't getting the, the gigs that I, that I had had, mm. uh, and it the uh, the market for digital music had come along. It decimated vinyl, and to be honest, I yeah. ran out of cash. It was. I sold a few bits. I sold a few bits. It was a really. Um... I was talking to Ant about that actually. Yeah. It was that was a that was a hairy old time that transition. Yeah, it was. I did a little bit before the digital transition, but nothing like you lot. Um, but it was um, we lost a fortune. going from being paid for actually being paid for the music that you produce to not yeah. being at all. And it's you, like, we, what the yeah, fuck? you know, I never really. I mean, if I if I had my fifty four year old head on back then, I would have been sitting yeah, there with out, with yeah. some yeah. kind of. I would have been sitting there with some kind of spreadsheet working out where my income was coming from and how much, how many gigs I needed to do and how many uh, recording sessions I needed to do and how many tracks I needed to release in order to make this much to mm -hmm. make sure that I always had food on the table and, mm -hmm. and gas in the car and, 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 you know, enough money to pay the rent and all that. But I, I, 
I sort of did do that, but I wasn't very organised. To be honest, I was too busy running around like a headless chicken a lot of the time, just doing gigs, coming back, writing some tracks, rushing off doing more gigs. It was very much like that. I see a lot of youngsters doing a very similar thing yeah. these days, and I'm like, you guys are so lucky that you've got, you know, digital you know, you've got your phones and you've got you, the internet and it's so much easier to keep track of what you're doing. But back then it was, it was much tougher. And of course I just didn't bother a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, I just kind of rolled with it. And then, you know, I was, I, I probably just didn't really realize how important that income from record labels actually was yeah. until it yeah. just wasn't there. And then suddenly it was like, Oh fuck. I've, yeah, I've got no money in my mm. bank account. What's going on? And, um, you know, really big uh, distribution companies just went down overnight. Prime disappeared. Intergroup disappeared eventually. Um, but the, the real big one for us was uh, Infectious. Infectious Distribution, which was run by um, mates of ours. Um, you know, um, essentially what happened was the chain broke down um it starts with the record stores the record stores were still buying stock but no one was going into the record stores to buy the stock uh, but they were still ordering stock from the distributors who were still ordering it from the manufacturers so that created uh, uh, paying, a, a, yeah. an, an enormous debt uh, which was owed by the record labels who were still supplying the distributors saying you know right we you know if the distributors were asking for more music music the record labels would would put in orders to have it manufactured and get it pressed and of course eventually all that happened was we ended up with tons and tons of records that couldn't be sold record stores that had gone out of business and just disappeared with all the money and distribution companies who sat in the middle of it just going what you know do? And, yeah and basically just fell apart from there and they went yeah. bust and of course when the creditors move in what do they do they all that stock and all that stuff it's just worthless it was worthless you couldn't yeah. you couldn't get rid of it there was no one to sell it to no one wanted it everyone was buying digital downloads or cds um your cds had, been, had already been in the market yeah for, they weren't and, they weren't the disruptor they were they that's the they thing. weren't they, it, they, they worked alongside download. the vinyl which was kind of helpful yeah, it was downloads that really, really put the yeah. nail in the coffin and hammered it shut because the CDs and digital music had been around for a while. But the thing is with with CDs was that, you know, they just wouldn't, they never really took the place of vinyl. But when the download thing happened, I think people couldn't really resist oh, it. Right. it. And the internet really, really it exploded. Offered, yeah, I mean, and, and the problem with the downloads is that it offered a multi-angled fuck you as well, because it wasn't just yeah. like, okay, yeah. we're going to put everyone out of business. But then it was like, okay, oh, well, by the way, artists, now your music that you work on uh, is going to be devalued as well, because mm -hmm. it, you don't, uh, now you're, it's like, you know, if you were now to take, Apple are taking 40, 40 pence out of every quid, just the, de the devaluation of music as a from a monetary value as well as a um, you know, yeah. how people kind of it, you know, the the the, the lands because the landscape's changed, people just they look yeah. at the the way that the digital realm kind of operates and they don't they don't oh, have uh, the same respect for the music, and that no. so that's a massive fuck you as well. There were so many arguments on forums and early versions of social media about the concept of digital music and people saying well i think music should be free anyway and stuff like that i just <laughs> right, go and write it then <laughs> i think that's quite that's that that, that 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 whole school of thought has been Cut quite completely debased now, but back then it was back and forth over a court. It's quite a big thing back then. People were like, "Yeah, free music. You know, music should be free. We should be allowed to express ourselves." And then there's all these artists like me sitting there going, like, looking at their wow. studio. Well, I'm going to have to sell any money. <laughs> yeah, I haven't got any money. I'm going to have to sell my stuff. So that no, not free music. Fucking hell, what are you doing? You know. Yeah. So um, it did. It killed. Well, it kept a lot of a lot of the uh, the we kept with the whole vinyl scene collapse, obviously, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would ended up just surviving on just gigs, and yeah. that wasn't anywhere near the level that 
the gigs no, are not, not like today when you know if you have got a, a career as a dj you can make a decent living i think um it's the only way to make a living really i, mean, I think if you, you know, are lucky enough to manage to cover both bases and you get like a lot of streams and a lot of uh gig um you know like high profile gigs but really uh, it's always been the same it's like a pyramid ask yourself how many people really inhabit that very top bit That's of right. the triangle not many not right. many and then there's everybody else underneath and and really yeah okay yeah you can look at charlotte devitt or carl cox or amelie lens or whatever but really how many people if you start counting them you might be talking about a few hundred you're, you're talking about yeah, you've only got to look at thousands of other other yeah, yeah. people who are giving it a shot. Yeah. You know, so yeah, the chances of of getting to the, uh, to that level are extremely small, and that but they always have been. They always you, have. Been. You've got to that. sacrifice something as well in order to do that. Like um, exactly, you know, I think you yeah, and I yeah. had this conversation. I won't say what the art, who the artist was that we were talking about, but um, you know, the fact that it's a very well highly regarded established artist and he's he was literally just putting himself out for peanuts just so that he could build a reputation in the industry and unfortunately he's still going strong it's great i think you you, you remember the conversation but the um the thing with that is um people take the piss out you do you know what i mean like yeah. when you get to a p the point where you're like oh okay yeah i'll do it just because i need to build a career um all the money grabbers are rubbing, rubbing their hands digging oh we'll, we'll fucking fleece this guy so well, you know, I mean, it was I, there was something on Facebook the other day, and it was a it was a uh, you know you get you see those kind of business people, uh, you know, a short video, uh, you know, join my business group and I'll show you how to make yeah a yeah 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 bucks right yeah I mean we, we've all, we've all seen them and most most people don't fall for them but some but it depends you know they can be very crafty how desperate you are how they it depends how desperate you are and they can be really crafty about how they come across and they can catch you occasionally even if you're really like tuned in and you're and you're, you're a smart person you might you can still find yourself falling for the pattern and you're like oh my god i don't believe they've done it again you know how did they get me i get out of the trading because i've been you know? trading on the side i get the every yeah. five seconds i get oh join my trading group and you're going to be a million there and it's just, yeah it's, it's just bollocks off, mate. but there was yeah. this guy and he said you know what i would do if i was a musician what i would do is i'd start a youtube channel and i'd start off just covering people's covering i saw that one yeah yeah did you see covers, covering yeah. songs that were in that are in the top 10 and i'd make covers and for each for every 10 covers that i do i'd add one of my own and he made he he basically built this whole kind of funnel idea of like i will basically cover other people's music in order to make my youtube channel more successful and once i reach a million subscribers that uh, every time i release one of my own songs it will get a million plays and that will be a hundred thousand dollars in the bank thank you very much yeah, and i just yeah. thought it doesn't that, look like that. It just doesn't that, look it? like that. Sorry, mate. You know, you just debased like art into yeah. like a very really simple fucking yeah. business formula, but it doesn't fucking work like that. Yeah. People need to like it in the first place. If they don't That's like right. what you're doing, yeah, then yeah, yeah, it has to be sonically yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, then you know, um, you could do that as long as you fucking want, and no one's going to buy it, <laughs> be interested by it at all, and you won't make a penny. You know, it's fucking stupid. But that's it's, youngsters are growing up with right. these days. They're growing up with this. This. Well, I was, was going to say to you, my my uh, attitude, and and I think they're to a certain extent. There's, you know, if, if you're a musician now, you have to, you do have to think business. You do, maybe yeah, not as do, cynically yeah. as that guy, but you do have to think business. You know, like, what am I going to do? How am I going to promote this? How am I going to make this different? How am I going to, you know, make, how am I going to get this? Is it possible to get this to pay itself back, pay back the hours of work and effort and all the rest of it? The problem is there are people out there that are doing these things that um, probably aren't realistic. Like I was, I was about to tell you, my, um, my kids are, but they're big on YouTube. They, that's all they do is watch YouTube. Um, yeah. And my my middle one, my middle daughter, she watches this girl called SS Sniper Wolf, and she's like a gamer. Um, mm. Started off as a gamer, um, but now her whole business model 
is to um, take somebody else's videos and then to, just to comment on them, just just mm. commentary the whole through yeah. the video. And she just sits there going, oh, what's going on? And yeah. this is this is her business model. And people, they go nuts for it. And they, they sit there watching these things on repeat. And I said to him, you know, you're making her rich, don't you? By, <laughs> by doing what you're doing. There's no talent in that whatsoever. She's, no. not, um, she's not offering you any kind of education. She's not offering you any, um, any understanding no. of like the, the wider world. She's just commenting on somebody else's video. So you've got people making millions doing that. So yeah. there is um there is a danger that everyone goes oh look how easy that is I can do that and I, I think the same can be said for music like techno not so much well maybe but oh I, I think all all styles are yes. uh, you know well, I'll give that a go do you know what I mean and it's like and then they quite yeah. quickly realise that it's a bit more to it than just putting some samples together and mixing it it is I mean you know. <laughs> What's even more infuriating is that when people do do it cynically, they actually can be quite good at it as well. Yeah. And then, then you just think, oh, my God. But yeah. I guess the thing is, is that I, I suppose for me these days, the more artists that I talk to, I've talked to a lot of younger artists recently, like this weekend, just gone actually in Glazart in France. I was chatting to uh, an artist. Called, her name's Anna, but I, she's got. Uh, yeah, I oh, know Anna. Well, she was at the last. Oh, no, 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 it's not 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 Anna. Oh, the no, artist. Oh, that's not Annie. Yeah. No, 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 oh, okay. No, uh, no different, uh, different yeah. person. Uh, right. I can't remember her artist name. Oh, uh, right, gotcha. It was the last gig I played in. Glazer. Anyway, she's uh, she's younger than me. The guys that were running the gig are a lot younger. They were like nineteen, fucking, you know, sitting at dinner with, a, with a, a table of like nineteen-year-old lads. I'm going to tell you a story about being nineteen in a minute, but yeah, go on. But uh, yeah, I mean, it was very interesting getting their perspective on, you know, on how to be a DJ and how to get somewhere in the music scene these days, and what these young young guys and young girls are uh, are facing in terms of, you know, a very difficult market to work in. And it's just very interesting because they look at it, the whole world. They look at the world of DJing as being a, in a very different way to the way that we looked at it when we were young. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. we, it wasn't, um, it 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 wasn't kind of uh, built then. You know, it didn't have a, a stable. Mm. It wasn't. You know, people didn't look at it as being a, a you know this a, some kind of career path. It was. Frankly, if you chose to be a DJ, you were a bit of a fucking idiot, really, back then. Life, and you were taking yeah. a, you were taking a massive chance, yeah. uh, chance. And you, you know, a lot of the time, you'd get you just you know you'd have to put up with the whole kind of go go and get a real job kind of jibes yeah. uh, from anybody who wasn't involved in the music industry. Whereas these days, uh, I think it's still it's still a bit like that. But but there's a lot more business sense. The kids have a lot more business sense than maybe we did when we were starting out. We started out much more, you know, artistic. It was for uh, the creativity and the, for the, because of, for the love yeah, of it. The creative, uh, uh, you know, a creative uh, uh, outgoing. And then uh, and I'm not saying that the youngsters don't have that. Of course they do. They they massively do. But I think they're also very aware no, of the, the internet generation. It, that's the thing. In order to right? stay, yeah, the internet generation, in order to stay in the game and to get somewhere in the game, you also have to, you know, look at the business and like, well, you know, work your way through it. But I think one of the, the only way that you can really do that successfully is to, it's, which sounds a bit weird, is is to kind of not take too much notice of what other people are doing and yeah. just get on with your own thing. Um, and, you know, try not to just, try not to, I meet a lot of people who say, you know, oh, so-and-so is doing this and, you know, yeah. you know, how do I get on this lineup and how do I get with it? You know, but I think um, uh, most of the time, really what you, what the artists that I admire the most are always the ones that just seem to just forge their own path. They just yeah, do yeah. that own thing regardless of how fucking popular it is and if they get a good gig like if awakenings rings you up tomorrow and says will you come and play you're like yeah and if they don't ring you up it doesn't matter it's just like whatever i'm just going to carry on doing my thing anyway because at some point maybe it might hit the right thing and it might get popular and it might not but at least i'll have i'll have enjoyed doing it 
Well, you know, I won't have done something really cynical and boring and, you know, sold my soul just to try and get popular. I mean, you could argue that maybe the selling your soul route is the only route to take these days, but I don't agree. I don't don't know. I don't think it is personally. (laughs) You know, um, every podcast I've had so far, um, everybody's agreed and I'm sure you're going to agree. The number one thing for me about being relevant in this music industry, in this underground scene especially, is how you connect with people, how you, yeah. how you communicate with people. Yeah. You know I'll pick the phone up and we'll chat on the phone. Yeah, And I that's agree. not because... Yeah. Um, Very important. It, it's not because, um, you know, I have joked about it, I'm an old fart and I don't do the internet, but it's just I like to talk to people. I just like to yeah. stay human. I like to keep that human element. Um, yeah. And it's, um, I think there is a danger of of, of, of losing that somewhere along the line. But um, yeah. I, I want to tell you a story now um, about when I was 19. And uh, I can't remember, I actually can't remember the club, um, but it was the first, the first time I went out, like me and my mates decided we were going to go out and we were going to go to a rave. We didn't really know what a rave was, but we, right. <laughs> um, we, my mates, I think it was my mate, my mates said, Oh, I found this uh, flyer for this thing called Trans Central. Do you want to go? Oh, right. And uh, I was like, yeah, let's go. So Trans- we, got on, we got on the tube. Off we went. I think it might have been Dalston because I remember it being quite a journey because we came over from West London. Yeah. And, um, and then we got in and we just, and you hear the, hear the kind of like the, the throbbing kind of sound. And it's like that first thing, it's like, oh, and then you get the nerves like, oh, is it, is it dangerous in there? Oh, what, what, what's going on? And then you're going up the, the staircase, you get searched by the bouncers and then, and you go in and the, the music's like, um, just hits you in the face when he like, when you open, open the door. It's probably Tyson street. It sounds like it, it was, was. Yeah. I think it probably was. Yeah. And uh, street. I remember like, and, and I went there and, and someone gave me a pill and said, I take it. it. So yeah. I took it. That place was filthy. And then I said, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they said, <laughs> ibuprofen. Um, <laughs> You're gonna need it, you? Yeah, yeah. We don't, <laughs> we don't, we don't uh, condone the use of illicit drugs on this podcast, ladies and gentlemen. If that is in the no, the right side uh, of the law is watching. Oh, um, anyway, yeah. So um, I didn't have 15 cans of Stella though because I was a proper lightweight when I was a kid. Um, and uh, then we um. <laughs> and, I, and then my mates like, oh, if you, this this guy is amazing. This DJ is amazing. And I'm like, I was stood there watching this dude, and I was just thinking, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. So I've got a big fat fucking green laser, biggest laser I'd ever seen in my life at the time. Yeah. Um, just smoke filled room, big warehouse, and you were stood, <laughs> DJ in a way, having a lovely time and. Uh, so you essentially were the first person to introduce me into the world of... Oh, it was me. Uh, it was you. Oh, yeah. really? Oh, well, playing at Tyson Street. Wow. I, it okay. must have been Tyson Street. I, thought, I, I was... I got I'm, not sure if it, I'm not sure it would have been, actually, because I don't think I ever played a... It wasn't uh, Tyson Street then, because it, it was definitely it you. Might have been in, it might have been Cloud Nine in Vauxhall. Uh, you know what? Uh, Yes, because no, it, it was south, uh, opposite yeah. the opposite the MI five building. You might, be, you might be right now. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it might have been that one. Either way, um, I played the main room in that one, but I didn't play the main room at Tyson's. At least I don't think I did. I don't think. Are you I sure? Because I'm pretty I'm sure. Not sure. I you. I'm not sure. Uh, nah. if I, if I'm honest. That 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 a, lot period of time, a period of time's a bit of a blur. I used to play live uh, as well, so I may not have been DJing as. as as such, I know I wasn't DJing that much. Well, you, it was definitely you because point. they. Uh, we I remember them in the morning. We were very excited and we started writing everybody's names down. And Dave the drummer, oh, right. kind of yeah. So, so he was. So, there. Yeah, that, and the reason why I'm telling you that yeah. story is that. You- fault um so with that in mind um have you got i know i mean it's a bit hard being a pioneer and all that but have you is is there a particular memory from your past where you've you just like it defined you 
Like it doesn't have to be techno, like anything like it, it, Oh it yeah. You, go, well, you know what? This is why I'm gonna this is what I'm gonna do with my life and I don't care if it turns out bad, I'm just gonna follow it. Um well I think um yeah, there were a few little moments really that kind of culminated into me sort of getting on this path and sticking to it for better or for worse. Um there were a lot of it was a lot of like you know symbiosis at that time a lot of things just kind of came together all at once the studio um the liberator dj guy you know thing like like i said you know like meeting chris for the first time and all that so stay up forever but also just getting thrown into the whole world of electronic music you know by various different people and going out with my mate marshall going out to lost and seeing richie orton and jeff mills for the first time um at lost in london that was a big really big night definitely a very very influential night on me it really made me you know t take notice um also um the night i was telling you about you know plastic man playing at um mega dog um you know i went i went along to that i was out in the crowd uh for that one uh, watched the whole set i was a huge still am huge plastic man fan uh got to play with him eventually years later yeah. just as he was started to do his dex effects and 909 thing i think the thing was is like you know, as I went through my journey, things, not only was there one sort of, there wasn't really one sort of massively defining specific point, there, but there were several things that just kind of occurred as I went through. And those things, each time something like that happened, it kind of solidified my decision to stick with the music and carry on you know trying to make my tracks better and make my productions better and you know learn new things and and eventually i became a dj so i was more of a production i was a drummer at first obviously and then i got into production and engineering kind of almost through drumming because yeah. you using the sampler along with my with my drumming i was playing along to loops and stuff like that so then that turned into engineering and then of course meeting djs and meeting more kind of electronic type musicians i eventually found myself playing records and um you know really enjoying it and loving the skill factor of mixing two records together and of course learning everything about all of that all the all the things that you learn man, to become a, D, a vinyl dj you know uh about you know the equipment how the equipment works different types of records how records are cut uh what they sound like when they're long as opposed to when they're short what they sound like at 33 as opposed to when you play them at 45 mm -hmm. how to use pitch control like how to read the record surface when you get the darker bits in the in the record where mm, which yeah, of course. it is quieter yeah. and the lighter bits are the louder bits and so on and being able to sort of you know um yeah there was a lot there are a lot of little little you know tricks that you need to learn when you're playing with the vinyl there are different tricks with the digital yeah. stuff i won't get into a vinyl versus digital it's just not worth it they're not the same but um think and i no think i play digital now and and you know there are lots of tricks to learn like if you're going to use sync which i do sometimes then if you're going to use sync then you need to know how that works because it doesn't do it for you there's that whole misconception everybody oh well, listen you press to the man it doesn't do it for you me. press the sync button and then it does everything for you well yeah no. but it no not really <laughs> if you make them as if you don't have your tracks sitting nicely on a beat grid they won't sync properly yeah. at all uh, yeah. and and the thing is at least with records you were completely in control yeah with yeah. The machines actually the machines are in control yeah. so you have to sort of suss out how the machines work well, well you're in, you're in control providing that the needle likes you if the needle doesn't like you then you're fucked well then the other the, the other side of uh, the uh, yeah of DJing with vinyl was the problems of just sound you know 
yeah needle skipping dusty records uh feedback mm -hmm. uh you know playing records in a warehouse you you know was actually i think about it now and i'm like what the hell were we doing you don't know? forget you don't forget the massive fucking delts that you end up with at the end of every week and yeah you've got, like you yeah. walk around like a postman yeah i mean all the whole like the all the, the records that you have to carry and all of that i used to have a really really bad neck, bad neck. me too i still uh, got it as a from, result of it from, yeah. the, from this yeah <laughs> you know in the bag like yeah, the, yeah, the, I'm the carrying the bag. bag if you watch, if you watch my uh, the, the the thing I did on Hall, um, you'll see that because I, I didn't use sync on Hall. I, I said to myself, "All right, I'm not going to use any sync on on for on Hall because I, I was I don't just going to gonna ask you did they did they it was there requirements? Did they give you no. requirements like you're not allowed to use nah. sync and because it, 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 it looks bad on the camera or whatever? No, no one has ever right. called me out for for using sync. Um, I got I've a theory had, on that. I'll let you finish and then I've, I've got a series. I've had wire. gigs where I've quite happily mixed without it because the sound system sounded great and there wasn't any delay and it was really easy and I was like, brilliant, and I can mix and I'm more than more than happy. But I've had other gigs where I've been like, oh, this is just such a fucking pain. I'm having to like, uh, is it, this? Uh, 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 you know, when you've got a bad monitor, the yep. there's a nasty delay, there's a sound, sound system at the far end of the room that's slapping back to you and all that and you just think, you know what? sync button Boom. It. Oh, fuck it you know it honestly sometimes i get a bit like despondent about it because i actually the process of mixing sometimes is improved by not using sync because it, yeah, it, yeah definitely you think a bit more about how those tracks fit together because you're actually actively fitting them together by adjusting the pitch. And and I think that even though you've got BPM counters and all the rest of it, there's, there's still a little bit of adjustment required and that's quite a nice thing to do. And it's quite yeah. a nice thing to hear as long as it's not too far out. But if it's a little, you know... But you have the choice. That's like, the thing. Oh, that's you've nice. got the choice. It's your choice. It's nobody else's yeah, exactly. choice. And I, yeah. I find I've got big problems with um, the purists, let's say. I mean, you've got yeah. purists like Chris who are like he's a purist for the right reasons. Like he, he just does what he does. He does what he does. But then you've got yeah. purists who are like, you know, half my age telling me why are you using a sync button? You, well, you know, only mix on vinyl, bro. And it's like, mate, I, <laughs> I've been in clubs in warehouses in, and I've, I've cut my chops on 1210s. I've, um, I know how to mix on 1210s. I've, put, I've, I've done everything I could possibly do to get myself into a position where I, feel I'm a fairly good authority on how to how to beat match and blend vinyl um to uh, and I feel like I've earned the the right to say if I want to make my life easier and use a sync button bear in mind also I can't see out my left eye at the minute I haven't been able to nah, see last year yeah, so every every gig deal. I've done recently has been on the colors of the names of the track of the tracks if the track's green i know i've played it if it's white i know i haven't i have to put them in a in a list mm. um and um and the sync button stops me from having to squint at the you know and, and see what's going on i don't mm. have to justify myself to anyone because I've already done it. And if you, if you are, uh, and I have been to gigs where um, there's a kid playing on a, I won't mention it who it was, but there was a kid playing on a, um, on a controller and he, um, the controller went down or something happened and he couldn't get up on. And I said, just use the, use the, the 200, the, the 200s, they were 200s. They didn't have the sync on him. Um, and he was almost in tears and turns out he didn't know how to mix. He was. It's just he hadn't he hadn't got to that stage, and it's like, listen, that's all fine. You have the ability to be able to learn all that stuff, but um, you can't. You just you you have to let every. It's all about individuality, and it's all about if I want to make my life easier by using the sync button, I'm going to do it, and I don't care if you think I'm a sellout or whatever. No, absolutely. Um, you know, so I mean, I, I I saw Cuba talking about sync buttons and saying just bloody use it if you need to see if you need to use it, use it. I think that um, I mean, you, you, the the but the the argument can go on and on and on and on forever. There's some people are going to yeah, agree, some people yeah. are just not not going to agree. It's just the way that it is. It's always just been the same uh, all my life. That's what the internet's for, isn't it? Arguing, yeah, arguing, but even, looking at even, cats. Even before the internet, you know, people were arguing about 
you know, purist arguments about whether you should use the 909 kick drum or whether you should use the 808 or whether you should yeah. use this or whether you should use that. It's just like, it hasn't stopped. It's just the, the it subject. Doesn't matter. Yeah, does it doesn't matter. It enrich your life by making somebody's life no. difficult. Over the, the, way, the way I see it is, as far as sync button is concerned, is it's halfway between a live set, which is pre-programmed, preset, and no one gives the people that play live a hard time. But yet they show up with just a laptop, and everything is pre synced Well, I mean, old, old Johnny Connor and um, and, uh, and Kramer uh, just they posted. I don't know if you saw this the other week. They posted up a picture of um, of uh, the DJ that they'd gone on afterwards, playing um, playing a on full set in, in, over in Japan. Um, mm. You know, I don't think we can avoid it. I just think people are addicted to the um, attention. They're addicted to the, oh, I just want to be on stage and get that feeling like everybody loves me. Um, and that's fine. If that's the way, if that's the way it's got to be for you, then, and that's why you're in this game, then, you know, have at it, man. I don't care. Um, but to be honest, that, that, that seems to be, that seems to be what makes the most successful DJs these days yeah. are people oh, who yeah. just really, really want to be on stage and want to show off and want to, want people to love them. Whereas most other DJs, the reason why they're up there is because they really want to play their music and they want to express themselves. But I, I like playing my music. I don't enjoy the process of DJing that much. Yeah. I enjoy we, we, the, uh, I enjoy the playing. That's the bit. Talk about I actually, this, I think before. Yeah. yeah we had, we've had sometimes a I have to say to myself, like Henry, it's all right. Just look forward to playing the gig. Don't don't think about getting in the club or dealing with the promoter or having to talk to people that you haven't seen for 10 years and you can't remember them and all that. Don't worry. Don't get anxious about any of that. Just concentrate on the what you're going to play for your first record. Just think about that. And so and I, I, I tend to walk into clubs a bit like straight to the decks. You know, I'm going up there, I put my bag down and I stand behind the DJ and I'm just like, yeah, cool. All right. And I'm yeah, getting yeah. to the bar maybe say hi to the DJ, then say hi to some people and try and just keep everybody at arm's, at arm's length and then and play. And, and once I start playing, then I actually, that's my payoff for all the hassle of yeah. getting the flight and getting up early and do, or do whatever else you need to do to get to wherever it is you've got to get to. If you've got to drive hundreds of miles or fly or whatever you've got to do, finally actually get in there and doing all the things that you that you need to do. And finally, when you get behind the decks, you're like, right now, finally, I get, I get to play my music. Yes. And, you know, try not to mess it up. And, and and but each time it's a challenge and you know and people react differently and you know and that I'm, that's the bit I enjoy but when it comes to all the pictures and all the outside of outside of the actual act of DJing that's the stuff that the Instagrammers are much better at than me I yeah 100% don't yeah. like that that thing that <laughs> whole like, oh, look, look, here I am outside Berghain and, and you know the shaky camera uh, thing that they do where they the, get their mates that, to the, the whole yeah, like yeah, yeah here I am playing sure, in front yeah. of yeah, people I, I, I think that's I, for the kids though do you know what I mean um, yeah, it's interesting what yeah. you were saying about um, about I'm when right you go you know you just go straight to the uh, turntables um I, when if it's for me, I don't know if it's the same for you, but like if I get if I get a booking where I don't know anyone personally, yeah. and I'm straight to yeah. the turntables, and I'm just I'm all business. But I've been really lucky recently. Like all of the gigs I've done, of all my mates are there. So it's like you like it's like hydraulics. It's just a perfect That's nice. example. Yeah. It's like it's amazing because we all turn up. We haven't seen each other for ages. We're all like yeah. we just have a good laugh. We, the green rooms are always, a, always interesting. Um, yeah, and I mean, last year was just like brill because you know we had Rachel and 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 uh, yeah coming in, and you know there were people that we yeah. hadn't met before as well, so it just felt like a real nice vibe. So that's when it was it's, good, that's when it? it's just a pleasure, isn't it? It's just a yeah. The, the hydraulics parties in particular have always been a bit of a high point because it's nice to bring everybody together. Last year I thought was particularly good because it just it because yeah we managed to get Rachel and Anne to come over people that hadn't 
been at hydraulics or played at hydraulics before but we're old mates and all that kind of thing and we but yeah it's a, it's a good little family vibe yeah. um obviously that we i'm right in the middle of organizing the next one right now which is um uh yeah really similar um you're you're not playing at it this time unfortunately mike which is a shame That's right. uh, i had no, to no 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 don't no no it's fine no, i had I'm to go for somebody new um uh, <laughs> so uh i did i chose uh but yeah no there's more uh djs from the from the family if you yeah. like um yeah, again i'm hoping that we get the same kind of family vibe uh this year sure um yeah sure yeah yeah fold is well, always I'll, I'll i'll be there anyway um yeah okay oh you're gonna come oh, well, oh of course brilliant. mate of brilliant. course of course um well, good. so yes yeah, so speaking yeah. of hydraulics then um might as well move yeah. straight on to that then so um what's the plan for hydraulics moving forward um have you got any have you got any kind of plans to shake things up or are you is yeah. it all just going smoothly at the minute and everything's tickety boo i think things are uh, uh things are just really changing for me as a as a person um just naturally because of several there are all sorts of things going on in my private life um mm -hmm. uh, which are you know health issues and stuff like that which i you, you know about i won't go into uh, uh, I think that's fine not necessarily uh but the point is is um also i'm just getting older um so i'm yeah. trying i'm looking at work in a different capacity i want to try and find things i'm trying to wind things down a little bit yeah. uh winding down the djing a little bit um over time um and and the hydraulics parties will continue for uh, for the time being once a year i'm not gonna i'm not gonna work i'm building that up I've, I've kind of reached a point where i've decided I'm not going to try and build anything up anymore. Well, promoting is a different game anyway. Anyway, if it starts to naturally slip away, I'll just I'm just going to let it go yeah. because I don't have the, the the energy or the youth to really like you know to try and really build something. It's it, there are some other guys on the scene that are doing that at the moment. I'm going just going to let them just get on with it. Um, as long as I get my one party a year, I'm happy with that. Yeah, I think that that's really fun. And the label, I'm on a similar sort of tip with that. I've released lots and lots of stuff by a lot of different artists over the last few years, which has been brilliant. And it's been a pleasure to do with all the artists. The label's might not over, but not by any means, but I am going to slow down the output quite a lot yeah. over the next uh over the next six months. Um, you know, we've got a few more releases on like on the books that are basically releases that are made by people who i promised i would put something out at, at some point so i've got some releases that are in the schedule there's uh, after that i'm going to take a bit of a break and yeah. slow it right down and i'm going to do some releases of my own i want to do an album yeah. i want to do some, yeah. some more stuff on vinyl um and like Bandcamp and yes maybe band camp ladies and gentlemen band don't camp. ever and forget also, band camp I'm banging on that at the minute. Yeah, and and nine oh nine London actually. I'm help. I'm working on nine oh nine London, which is actually it is actually coming together. That's going nice to be quite one. a nice little download store once it's ready. It's very very well, close. Keep actually. me in the loop with that one, then, mate. Because I'm, I'm in with the uh, the development and the the you know the concept and all of that. I've been work working on it for. Oh, a couple, good couple of years now. Actually, it's probably more like four years. It's been mm. sort of ongoing. We're not, no, no one's being paid. It's very much like we just do it as it, as and when. Labor of love. I think we finally hit uh, a good team and a good um, um, technology kind of base for the shop because what we were using before probably wasn't going to work all that well so the guy who's developing it uh neil has moved on to using some much better technology awesome. it's a little bit it's pushed the site into a slightly different place but ultimately it's going to happen um and it will be a really nice yeah. site once it's I up and running wait for that yeah, yeah it should be really good it's gonna be a nice little a nice little uh kind of like acetechno hub 
we want to keep we want to keep it underground we want to keep the music that's on there underground we we it's it's a very i won't get it too i won't go too far into it because the whole business program uh, uh, planning behind our download store is there's a fine line between giving me information and then just putting it on a how podcast much, in there how much time <laughs> have you got it just goes it, it, honestly but yeah it's looking I'll, I'll just leave it as saying that it is looking good very very yeah. positive um and maybe yeah. that'll be yeah. something that will keep me going and of course i've been cutting records at curb pusher that's been really really great i've really really enjoyed that i'm still doing it i'm still there for the foreseeable future as far as i know and that's it yeah that's it really just w- working um getting to that retirement age you know yeah when do i finally get a chance to say okay that's it thanks very much ladies and gentlemen and good night you know <laughs> when well, does it happen if, if the baby's got anything to do it to say about it probably never mate probably honest. never you still no. be there when you're 85 i don't think i'll ever really like announce my retirement in any kind of i tried of way. it and then it just pulled me back in you just do what you can yeah. and you have to be very tough with yourself about that. Sometimes you really do have to say, and it can be very difficult because you can be looking at like when you're, especially when you're looking at gigs, you're trying to look six months in advance and you're thinking, am I going to want to in six months time, am yeah. I going, going to want to do this you want gig? To get on a plane, sit in, sit do in I really want to do course. this? Yeah. And then you look at what's around it and you think I'm going to need to be there and there and there and then so and so wants me to come and do this as well. Yeah, and we're not getting paid the kind of money that you would get to have a sort of like private jet so, to, to no. take you wherever you need to go. So it's <laughs> so you then know. you're kind of thinking, okay, yeah, I do, you know, I'll do what I can. That's all I can do. I'll do what I can. And if it, if 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 someone gets in touch and says, you know, can you, you know, come and drive all the way up to fucking land's end and or up to john o'groats and play a gig for us uh, you know and the next night i've got a gig in land's end i'm gonna be like no yeah. i might have, i might have done it when i was in my 20s i yeah. probably would have done. i'd go like fucking john o'groats land's end no problem i'll do it, I'll do it. standing on my, head, my old green side. transit van but not now so you know there have to be uh there have to be limits to what i can and can't do yeah, these course, mate. Well, we're only human aren't we that's the yeah thing. yeah so um emerging artists have you got any are there any djs or or producers that you've got your eye on at the moment that are like emerging not like you know long-standing ones um there are various people, of course, you know, there's always going to be, like, I mean, people who are, I always mention people who are on hydraulics, you know, like yourself, I mean, you're not an emerging artist, you've been around for a long time. I mean, uh, ba- Bailey, uh, yeah. I suppose I would count, uh, because he has made some great music and no one seems to really quite catch on to it, apart from a few people who love his music. Yeah. Uh, imagine uh, Cinque Dia, of course. There's Deb, Cinque Dia, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, uh, who she's a student of yours as well, isn't she? She was a student of mine, yeah. and um, she yeah, is we love Cinque Dia. Through. Um, she's also a very good DJ, really good tune selector, great selector. DJ. Um, and she's going to be playing at the next Hydraulics party. Uh, um, who else? Well, you know, there's no, Jay. I really like Jay Marax. And Tommy. Right. Sorry, go on. I really like Marax at the minute. I yeah. was going to mention Marax. Yeah, he's coming to play at Hydraulics actually this How year. Oh, is he? Oh, that's oh. fab. That's brilliant. That's the lineup. I'll, I'll tell you the lineup. The lineup yeah, is uh, Speedy J boy, boy. and Arco in the, in the main Jay. room. Speedy J and Ada Arco. Yeah, I met Ada. Uh, in Paris, and she's lovely. Yeah. And her and my wife Justine are really, really good Instagram mates now that as well. Doesn't surprise uh, me. Uh, Anyone that Justine no, makes, ends up being. And she's brilliant. She played a she played a stomping set at this warehouse party in Paris. And when we were thinking like we we want somebody, uh, preferably female, to be uh, you know to take one of the headlining slots, yeah. uh, she was obvious. So we went to Ada. Uh, a similar idea to Anne from last year, Annie. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Although Annie, m- more techno. Ada is a bit more ravey, but uh, you know, there's there's a similarity. Uh, 
so yeah we wanted somebody to occupy that slot and uh and then of course for the main slot uh the old the kind of the more that's kind of the way the hydraulics has kind of developed we didn't really mean it to go that way but it's kind of developed like that where there's always one kind of old school really well-known name as the headliner the draw, like yeah. last year it was yeah. slam yeah. the year before that we had perk and you know it, i mean and we've had cj bolland and people like that you know yeah 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 um so but, but you, you know, know what's really in, sorry you know what's really yeah. interesting about the hydraulics parties um is it's all the peripheral uh, uh, acts yeah well. yeah like, it, it's 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 just a it's it's just jam-packed with talent yeah um, yeah, and it's always been that way ever ever since. Well, ever since I yeah. started, I played the first one and 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 yeah. attended others. It's just there's always a there. There's a little gems that you just you're not you know about them, but then you, then when you leave, you like you really know about them. Do you know what I mean? They're really good. When uh, that's the thing. I mean, I think you know, it's like yeah, you know, God, it's such a difficult world. You know, trying to get somebody to listen to your DJ mix is so bloody difficult. And there are so many DJs out there trying to do it. And I feel for them because I know how difficult it is. But when you go into a room and you watch a DJ actually play and you realise, wow, this guy or girl or whoever is yeah. really good. Fucking hell, they're actually really, really on it. And they're reading the crowd and they're playing good music and they're mixing it well and they're doing something inventive with what they're you know with how they're mixing they're not just just pressing play and 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 pushing the faders up they're actually cool. doing something really interesting with the process then it, it, that always gets my attention whenever i see somebody do that i don't care how old they are how young they are if, if i see somebody doing that especially someone who i've not maybe paid any attention to i don't really listen to other people's dj mixes i don't have time i don't have time uh so i've had a few people sending me things sending me demos and stuff like that and saying uh, you know i've had a couple couple of people asking me to play the hydraulics party this year and i'm like i don't really do it like that i, mm -hmm. I pick pick the people that I've seen with my yeah, own eyes. Yeah, because it's your birthday as well. So this is, yeah. it's like, it's yeah. a bit different, isn't it? It's not like you're, yeah. just, you're not just putting a, like, a schedule together. You're, it's not you're, a sort you're of planning club. an actual birthday party. Yeah, it's not a club promoter type thing. If you, you and know, that's why I love it. That's why I love yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's just, it's a personal thing. I like yeah. it. I want it to be, you know, I'm a massive Speedy J fan. Oh, so, yeah. you know, his Loud Boxer series and, you know, his album uh, uh, Ginger years ago. And there were a whole, and the Public Energy uh, album that he did and, you know, stuff that he put out on Warp and all that. I'm not expecting him to play all of that, but all the stuff that he's done with Store recently and all the sort of live set stuff that he's done with surgeon and lady starlight and so on and so on and the things that he's been doing at the paradiso during ade and all of that have been pretty fucking awesome so i must admit he was somebody that i thought we just got a game along man just yeah. because he's fucking speedy J. yeah absolutely yeah man. Uh, like, there's only, there's only, yeah there's only he's there's done only, so you know, much for ten of like, others that can gotta get him down you know so it was like that with slam as well you know um uh same thing that so important to the scene you know a lot of i don't want to really say it but a lot to a lot of the youngsters really in a lot of ways you wouldn't be here if it wasn't for speedy j oh, you right, know it's right. as simple as that i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for somebody like speedy j wow. so you know we had to get him along so yeah uh so him and ada arco we've got cinque Deer and uh and michaela playing, playing in the main room or is she they're she's playing, she's playing back to back in the main room a, oh, right. a two hour back to back set i Think asked them both, and who sorry and Michaela collide. Oh, Michaela, fab, excellent. Because we really fun. wanted to get um, Blasher and Alat to come and play, who are a female tag team from yeah. Sheffield, I think, and they're lovely people. We've met them a couple of times before, really, really sweet. But I've tried to book them, and they're so popular, I can't, can't, couldn't get them. Right. And I thought to myself, hey, hang on a second. <laughs> 
Oh, well, I maybe know, we can make like our own tactic, <laughs> you know. So I, I asked them both, and like, look, would you and be they're not going to say no because they love you. Well, and to be, I did give like them. I did say you don't have to do this. I, I am just asking, but would would you be up for it? And they were both like, yeah. It, oh, it's it's the, not one, no. they played back to back before. That was part of the reason why I asked, and because. Both of them said that about the other. Oh, that's the only person I can play back to back with. I've tried oh, it. Right. Really? We are other people and hated it, but they both really enjoy playing back to back with each other. So I thought, well, that would be really nice. Put them on in the main room. So that's them. And then myself and Jay Tommy, Marcello Perry is coming back from oh, Colombia. Oh, to play. Good so good he's going to be there. And then oh, the back again, we've got Marax, we've got Jack Magic. Uh, yeah. We've got Crystal, uh, DJ Aldania. Uh, bloody hell, I'm going to start forgetting names now. Oh, shoot me if I've forgotten your name. Um, my mind is going to go blank in a moment. Uh, who else have we got in there? Hang on, let me get on a fucking notepad. <laughs> <laughs> I, can't I can't forget. I can't don't forget. don't push the grey matter too much. Is that alkaline? Of course we have. We've got is that alkaline? And we've got Glenn Hamilton and we've got Simon Cyrus the Virus. There you ah, go. So fab. The virus well, I'm definitely Belgium. going to be there then as a... Um, is that uh, is Guy's wife. She's Brazilian, living in London. She's yes. Happy. Yes. Uh, and Glenn is, he's all the way up in Glasgow, I think. And he, he, he is, runs yeah, I know Glenn, Hammer, uh, Hammer, Hammer Tone. Tron. Hammer, Hammer Tone. Tone. Hammertone. Hammertone, yeah. And uh, what's the, the name of his label? It's Techno... Um, uh, Techno Connects. Techno I've, Connects. I've still, right. oh, I've, I'm still owe him a release, actually. Sorry, Glenn. Made some great, made some great tunes. Um, yeah. so, yeah. And he's been doing the videos for Hydraulics. Yeah. For Lovely bloke. And, you know, we met a while back and... Uh, yeah, I just thought it would be... So that's a really nice... We've got a nice family vibe again. Love it. Love uh, it. I obviously, like I was looking at, uh, I, you know, it, you, you're such a great uh, family. Right, you're gonna get, you're gonna get me onto the festival stuff. This yeah, year, another anyway, time. So. But you know, it's it was like I was thinking, yeah, well, I could bring Mike, but then I was, I really wanted to try and bring. Wait, there's only so much you can do, really. You've got yeah. to, and I don't yeah. think I, uh, my last release in hydraulics was well over six months ago now. So, uh, you, yeah. I will give you some more stuff, but oh. Not, well look mechanical's i mean it's just mechanical's just kind of robbed me of all my time and effort and yeah effort well it does doesn't it? it and this is it that's what's happened with hydraulics with me and I'm, I've, I've had to i'm fighting back a little bit now and trying to claw back some time yeah uh, because i do really need to uh i i i want to make some music yeah of course yeah, <laughs> I'm not, yeah. I, all i'm doing is remixing other we, people we want you to make some music as well yeah i mean i <laughs> I, I need to do it for my soul. So, yeah, of course. Of course. Um, it so, makes you yeah. feel alive, doesn't it? So. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I still love it just as much as I always did. Um, so, yeah, making some music and putting it out on the label. And the putting it out on the label isn't the important bit. It's the making of the music that's the important. Yeah, bit. That's exactly. the fun bit. And I, want, I like being in a creative frame yeah. of mind. And the only, t- only time I can do that is when I manage to clear some of the admin off the desk that's and, right yeah you know and then it's getting yourself a la- label manager mate that's what you need um i thought about like, that please, i thought about that <laughs> you've got yeah, to make sure you've got someone that you're it because you're I, really actually, working I, with. I didn't want another i just didn't want another person in the team at that yeah, point tough. yeah because then you've got to relinquish responsibility and, and allow them to kind of do things and that can sometimes be Hard. I think I've, I've right, we're going to run out of time. So though. much time bossing them about. Or <laughs> so yeah, I'm yeah. Better off doing it myself. Yeah, to be exactly, honest. exactly. Okay. Yeah, it's just never done to your standard. Um, we're going to run out of time, so Bye, I'm going to use this to uh, sign off and say thank you very much, mate. Um, well, for joining me. Um, I've been to you, Mike. I hope you've enjoyed it and I've 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 had a blast talking about um all sorts of stuff. It's just we always end up I forgot to ask you about your cars and stuff. I was gonna ask you about your cars no. and how that's going, but I can do that off off right. it goes it goes the, the life just goes on doesn't it mate it does, but, it, uh, does it does yeah look you know oh, great thanks for inviting me and, mate uh, you know, thank you for coming and Bye. um yeah we love you we love dave the drummer love we always too. will and uh <laughs> i hope you've enjoyed this um this podcast ladies and gentlemen thank thanks, you very much. see Good you night. mike take care of yourself